Uh, start with a quote from Richard Grunberg's book, A Social History of the Third Reich. The overall psychological improvement was outpacing the material advantage. 70 million votes, the most electorally popular GOP presidential candidate in history, the biggest share of non-white voters for any GOP candidate in decades, and he increases share of, vote, of the vote among all women. He increases vote in the counties where deaths from COVID-19 were highest. In the beginning, Trump was supposed to be some sort of aberration. And of course, everybody knew he wasn't, but there was always the subject supposed to believe in American innocence. Four years later, four years of militias, neo-Nazis, gun-toting murderers, mass death, hydroxychloroquine, uh, concentration camps for migrants, family separations, digital alternative realities, uh, Dixie anti-communist fantasies, racist vigilantes, and Trump has expanded his popular base in most demographic constituencies, except, interestingly enough, his assumed readout of white men. The supposed aberration was a bit more like the skull in Hans Holbein's painting of the ambassadors, a glimpse of the American real. It only looks like a distortion until you see what it is. 70 million votes for something like incipient fascism, fascism without fascism. Do we even know what it is? No other GOP candidate could have achieved this. And those who turned out for Trump, and they really turned out for him, weren't out for a marginal tax cut or to raise defense spending. They voted for Trump the logo, the hot medium of their microfascisms, the endlessly amusing media savant. So what's so appealing about this form of politics? I wanna put aside the hardy perennials about whiteness and toxic masculinity, which though useful coordinates tend to be question begging and start from the premise that we have no idea what we're facing here. I wanna suggest that there is nonetheless something addictive about this politics I'll start with the red pill because the red pill is a form of addictive psychopharmacology. And this is of course counterintuitive because the red pill is supposed to awaken one to an intolerable, terrible reality. And yet from the apophenic resonances of QAnon to the castration anxiety of the MRAs to the end times relish of the evangelicals and boogaloo preppers to lone wolf fascists psychically fueled for genocide the image of disaster, of annihilation, seems to be compulsive. Adorno wrote of the addictive qualities of anti-Semitism. He said, the anti-Semite cannot sleep until he has transformed the whole world into the very same paranoid system by which he is beset. He simply cannot stop spiraling from petty grievances to the wildest conclusions, tantamount in the last analysis to the pronouncement of death sentences against those whom he literally cannot stand. This is the logic of pornography where one always wants riffs on and more extreme versions of the same. So what is addiction and what is it to become addicted to catastroph catastrophic social media content? What is it to find Tommy Robinson's YouTube histrionics so addictive that a depressed, alcoholic, unemployed man, Darren Osborne, is converted into a lone wolf murderer in the space of three weeks? The social industry, which is the network of platforms through which our social lives are increasingly and incessantly written, constituted by digital writing, is supposedly organized on the economic model of addiction. And they adopted this framework from machine gambling. And Silicon Valley has spawned a slew of books, articles and testimonials even from guilty former social media bosses, celebrating or lamenting the strategy as they see fit of getting your customers hooked. Now they base their techniques on a combination of behaviorist precepts and neuroscientific reductionism. They believe that their system administers a stream of intermittent rewards uh, experienced as a rush of dopamine upon seeing your notifications bright red like a clickbait headline. Intermittency is important according to them because predictable rewards would not, like a mercurial lover, keep you guessing. Of course, dopamine doesn't actually give us a rush. Uh, it's associated rather with the pathways for appetite than satisfaction. To trace the biochemical signature of an experience is not to explain its meaning. 
And if gambling is the model here, the characteristic experience of the gambler is not necessarily pleasure, but a net loss of pleasure in betting, an experience as sort of an emotional flattening, which is uh, undertaken to cope with the terrifying losses. And the emphasis on pleasure omits the curious satisfaction that addictions bring through their proximity to death. Alcoholics, smokers, heroin addicts, gamblers, they're all administering small doses of death with each hit. Social media addicts can tell you that it is when the machine coldly lashes out or coldly holds out, or even seems to turn on you delivering blow after savage blow that it seems most compulsive. The death drive. Lacan of course argued that there's only one drive and it's virtually a death drive. So both deathly and virtual. The drive, of course, isn't an instinct. It's not a wish um, because an instinct or a wish in principle can be satisfied. The drive is a virtualization, a montage. It spins on eternally with no concern for the well-being of the organism or even the ego. And how is this montage composed? In the traditional Oedipal story, it starts with the needful child trying to work out what her parents want from her in order to be loved. The montage is formed by her guesses as to what they might demand of her, need overwritten by demand. Yet in the era of digital capitalism, households are not simply dominated by a small number of adults, they're penetrated by a panoply of media devices, filaments of capitalist ideology. And if the drive is a sort of mental writing, a montage of symbolic elements, it's surely now composed in part of elements drawn from the written network of signifiers that constitutes the social industry. And its demands, its constant interpolations harness the drive to the logic of addiction. Lacanians uh, tend to argue that addiction is a diction, an alternative to speaking. Why bother going through the messy, disappointing business of social relationships if you can get your satisfaction from an addictive device? And among the many critiques of the social industry as an addictive apparatus are that far from giving satisfaction, supposedly it causes depression, self-harm and suicidal behavior. And yet, of course, if we weren't already more depressed and socially disappointed than we have been for a long time, would we have turned to this remedy? The toxicomania cultivated by the social industry rivets its depressed subjects to what the Landians call unintelligible webs of swore machinery, mad gnomoid clusters in which contradictory affects and desires are temporarily aligned to generate a mood, a crescendo, so that everyone on your feed seems to be thinking the same thing or feeling the same way. The apparent offer of social contract contact is displaced, therefore, onto the delivery of rhythmic surges of excitement, anticipation, hate, sexual arousal. Power, Roland Barthes tells us, always imposes a rhythm. Rhythm is repetition and variation, the military, the chain gang, the cotton field, the production line, the everyday life that Henri Lefebvre wrote about, the social industry. The algorithm of the social industry, as Matthew Flissveder calls it, is one of many apocalypses. The constant gathering and alignment of expectations, the acceleration and concentration of time, the buildup into tiny bursts of pseudo prophetic exaltation and then dissipation and diffusion until the next cycle begins. And as the main format in which our social life takes place, because even before the pandemic, we spent more time conversing and interacting through screens than face to face, its logic permeates and spreads everywhere into workplaces, public transport, government departments, television, entertainment, and of course, those political media assemblages that we used to call parties. Thus the cycle of addiction, opening up new vectors of politicization as it harnesses and accelerates existing cultural schisms into regular online shitstorms in relation to which we, the users, the micro celebrities jockeying for position, for likes, for attention, for shares, define ourselves and our future standing. Birthergate, Gamergate, 
somehow these shitstorms always seem to birth new forms of reaction. And to inhabit this system is also to experience the neoliberal geist of competitive paranoia and victimhood magnified and accelerated because everyone is a potential troll. Everyone will betray you on the turn of a dime if you say the slightest wrong thing. Something bad happens to you on this system, as in all other walks of life, it's because someone has it in for you. In his essay on the far right and depression, the open democracy journalist Adam Ramsey reported on his infiltration of a major conference of the European far right, in which he was astonished to find that the room was full of men struggling with their own demons, deeply, deeply depressed. In other words, they might well feel persecuted because whatever the world has done to them, they're also persecuting themselves. And they have found in fascism a way to turn their demons into a demonology. Fascism is exhilarating because tuning into the dream work of racist or sexist ideology or class fear or class injury, it furnishes the meaning bereft with a mythic formulation of their dilemma. A mythic formulation, fascism only formulates it cannot, of course, resolve the dilemma any more than MRA forums can cease stoking their participants' castration anxiety or Islamophobic YouTube can allow participants to think the threat is receding. That would be disastrous for it would let the demons back in. It must escalate merely to keep going, to keep delivering the hit as tolerance builds up. Invasion, Death panels, Chinese climate hoax, white genocide, concentration camps, genocide by substitution, Islamization, the great replacement, communism without communism, Satan, globalists, elites, cultural Marxists, Islamic terrorists, the Jews who will not replace us. The stakes never diminish in this high octane struggle for being, not for one second, not until the lone wolf carries out his massacre and then almost to a man begs to die not until the planes return and start bombing their own cities. How pitifully inadequate to call this stuff fake news or even conspiracy theory. This layering of apocalyptic rhythm, apocalyptic expectation and apocalyptic desire is in some ways a perfect diagram of the capitalist discourse, capitalism, whose cult of accumulation demands infinite escalation more hits, more kicks, more satisfactions now in a finite ecosphere and whose telos is of course disaster. <laughs>